Welcome. I'm going to tell you about a fascinating field experiment, one of the largest ever conducted in a real-world industry setting. The study takes place in the automotive industry, which has a unique approach to selling and distributing its products. Due to franchise laws and the independent nature of automotive dealerships, manufacturers rely on large-scale incentive programs to influence the behavior of these distribution channels. These cash-in-the-trunk incentives make up about an $18 billion industry. My company, Merits, has been designing and running programs like these channel incentives for many of the major auto manufacturers for over 70 years. The idea for our field experiment originated with our client. The head of sales for a major auto manufacturer proposed an idea for changing the timing of the bonus payouts for the incentive program. He thought, what if instead of paying the dealership bonuses at the end of the month, based retrospectively on whether they hit or exceeded their monthly target, we pay the bonus at the beginning of the month. Then, if the dealers hit their target, they keep the bonus. But if not, we claw it back. Now, many of you will recognize that this idea of a clawback contract has its roots in a popular principle from behavioral economics, loss aversion. A number of papers in behavioral economics suggest that implementing these loss contracts would increase vehicle sales, as dealers might work harder to protect the bonuses with which they've been endowed. But loss contracts haven't been tested in this context before. We didn't know for sure whether a loss contract policy would necessarily increase sales. These incentives are paid at the dealership level. Could firms exhibit loss aversion? If so, how exactly would that affect sales? And would we see a difference between the two model groups sold at these dealerships? We set out to run an experiment to find out definitively. Our experimental data included 294 dealerships randomized at the DMA level into a loss treated and a control group and $66 million of incentive spend over eight months. We focused our analysis on the data after a period of four months, after which point we flipped the groups for fairness. Now, what did we find? Did the loss contracts increase sales, causing loss treated dealers to work harder to protect the bonuses with which they had been endowed in advance? The short answer is no. Compared to control dealerships, we saw a 5% sales decline in the loss treated dealerships, which equates to about $45 million in lost revenue over four months. We see that this average decline is driven entirely by a 16% plummet in sales in one of the two model groups sold by these dealers. This is why we test first. Without a control group to observe the difference in difference effect, we wouldn't have known that the loss contracts were hurting sales because sales were trending up over that period of time anyway. Without this experiment, the manufacturer might reasonably have rolled this policy out across its entire dealer body to an annual system-wide loss of about $1 billion. For practitioners aspiring to lead like scientists, this is the lesson. Don't just do it, test it. But why did this happen? This is the novel insight for designing effective incentive policy. Our evidence suggests that loss aversion, caused by the threat of clawing back the bonuses, does increase focus on the sales targets. But the relevant question becomes what do dealers do when they're hypersensitive to these targets? Dealers have two main levers to pull in achieving these sales objectives. The first is effort. They can focus resources, energy, and people on selling as hard as possible. But it turns out the payouts on these stair-step programs are typically so consequential that the dealers are already working really hard to hit them. The second option is to change how they divide effort across tasks. In our setting, the relevant tasks are selling different groups of cars that count towards different bonus systems. In our data, we see very clear evidence that loss framing leads dealers to neglect the model group with smaller bonuses and thus smaller losses, to focus on the bigger loss model group. Our key takeaways are threefold. First, mind your stair step. Steep tiers and hyper salient targets with all or nothing payout systems can encourage gaming and loss framing can exacerbate this. So two, loss framed incentives are not always a good idea. Popular behavioral economics theory might suggest that loss framing is unambiguously helpful but the real world provides situations where predictions are in fact more nuanced. And third, behavioral biases like loss aversion are not just for individual humans, 
firms exhibit them too. And of course, that managers who lead like scientists can avoid costly missteps by running experiments before implementing system-wide incentive policies.